Hello? Okay. Dear audience, hello from the Netherlands. It's a great honor for me to join you today on the very first Animal Welfare Conference in Indonesia. Congratulations on taking this important step and incorporating education on welfare and behavior in the curriculum of veterinary medicine. I'm Vivian Görlich. I'm assistant professor at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Utrecht, the Netherlands, and I do research and teach on animal behavior, physiology, and welfare. In the following, I would like to show you some of the examples we keep ourselves busy with. And to emphasize the importance of animal welfare research and education. The world is changing, and so is the role of the veterinarian. Whereas health was previously the main focus of, of the veterinary profession, meanwhile, animal behavior and welfare are coming more into the picture. The concept of One Health describes how the health of humans and other animals and the environment are connected and similar holes for one welfare. Humans and other animals, we share the same planet and for a sustainable future, we need to look out for each other's welfare. But before we start diving more into the topic, I'd like to first set a framework. Because animal welfare is quite a complex concept and people can have different ideas on what good welfare is, depending on your background and your knowledge. So whenever you start investigating or teaching on welfare, it is important to inform yourself on the concepts that are out there and then also define which concept are you applying in your work. In the 1960s, the Campbell Committee formulated the Five Freedoms, a very important first step towards monitoring and safeguarding animal welfare. The freedoms were developed mostly for animals kept in a farm context and stated that for good welfare, an animal should be free from hunger, thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, or disease. It should have the freedom to express behavior and should be free from fear and distress. While certainly useful and necessary at that time, meanwhile, we've realized that the five freedoms actually focus only on the absence of negative states, but not on the presence of positive states. So they are not sufficient anymore to describe animal welfare. But since then, there has also been quite some development in the theoretical and conceptual approach to animal welfare. Together with my colleague Saskia Arndt, professor in animal behavior, and Franz Josef van der Stijl, we have published our dynamic animal welfare concept this year. We propose that welfare is a long-term state, so cannot be measured by a one-time snapshot. Welfare is dependent as well on internal as external factors, and we emphasize the importance of positive states, as I will show you in the following slides. We suggest that an individual is likely in a positive welfare state when it is mentally and physically capable and possesses the ability and opportunity to react adequately to internal and external conditions. And this part depends to a large part, of course, on the health of the animal, um, being free from injuries, having a healthy condition, but also on certain breed characteristics that might keep the animal from reacting adequately to challenges. And so here the veterinarian as expert has an important role in safeguarding the health of the animal and also having opinions on the breeding of certain uh, breed types. Moreover, we say that adequate reactions deal with environment are elements of an animal's normal behavior. 
They allow the animal to cope with and adapt to the demands of the environmental circumstances, enabling it to reach a state that it perceives as positive, that is, that evokes positive emotions. Unfortunately, we have still not found out how to measure emotions, but we can describe them based on physiological and behavioral readout parameters. And that's why we also emphasize the importance of animal behavior when studying animal welfare. When we assess animal welfare, we can look at the animals themselves. And here, knowledge of their biological and etological needs is really crucial. Because, as I said, behavior is such an important readout parameter of their welfare. So if animals are showing behaviors which they are highly motivated for and they have the opportunities, that is already a sign that the animal likely is in a state of higher welfare. So you can see here the tick and dust bathing, the pig rooting, or mammals showing their need to show parental behavior or suckling. On the other hand, to show these behaviors, animals need certain resources and should be enabled by the management, especially kept animals. So here is the second pillar of animal welfare assessment, where we look at resources and management. And luckily, the approach is changing from adapting the animals to the environment to adapting the environment to the animals to enable them to fulfill their behavioral needs. These two pillars of animal welfare assessment we combine in our master track animal welfare risk assessment and management. So the veterinary medicine students can choose to specialize themselves on animal welfare. And for their research internship, they choose a certain population of animals at a, at a certain location. And they note down all potential hazards and opportunities at that location. So factors that may have a negative impact on welfare or positive impact. And so far, we have had these risk assessments in a lot of species a lot of context here, just some examples on dogs used in teaching at the faculty, farmed fish, dairy goats, big cats at the sanctuary, horses in a riding school, or deer in a semi wild farm. So, this is really a promising approach to bring both the risks animals face in their environment, but also more knowledge on their biological needs together. Another aspect on safeguarding animal welfare, which we um, follow, is through our work in laboratory animal science. As a researcher, for sure, but also as a veterinarian, you will come in contact with laboratory animals, and maybe you're performing research yourself. And so, you will know what the three R's stand for, replacement, reduction, and refinement. Meaning that if there is another way to perform your research without using animals, that should be preferred. If you need to use animals, you should use as little number as possible. And for the animals you are using, you should refine the experimental procedures to minimize stress, pain, and discomfort the animals are experiencing. So we teach the lab animal science course and not only on rodents but also recently we have developed species specific modules ranging from pigs to ruminants, carnivores and even birds. And these courses have now also been accredited by the FILASA International Association. Next to teaching students and professionals, we also recognize the importance of the society. 
As I started One Welfare, it involves humans and animals. And humans might have um, an ambiguous relationship to some of the animals if they're not in the typical context of companion animals or farm animals. And one example here is the pigeon, especially the ones we find in the cities. And um, to investigate the attitude of people towards these pigeons, um, we started a project where we also involve school children. First of all, in the discussion of how we view animals in our society and how we treat them, but also bringing them closer to science. We did a project with a school in Utrecht where the kids for two months got lessons on how to do science, how to ask a good research question. And that's all about pigeons in the city. And then finally, the 250 pupils went out and counted the birds. And this is really a nice uh, example of how education on animal behavior and welfare also can bring people closer to the animals. And that is an important step to take for the sustainable future. To safeguard and promote welfare, also our dynamic animal welfare concept gives some recommendations. Here you see some example strategies to improve animal welfare. And that starts with the breeding and selection. And we recommend to select unhealthy breeds and pedigrees and select desirable behavioral traits. This is, of course, a long term process where the veterinarian can advise in any context, maybe companion animals or farm animals. Also, the veterinarian has, of course, the prominent role in preventing illness, safeguarding the health of the animals, and ensuring proper health care and vaccinations, which will affect the welfare of the individual animal to a great extent. And finally, especially for animals kept under human care, we need to improve the knowledge of owners about their animals. We need to investigate the needs and behaviors of the animals we keep and then ensure that the husbandry enables the animals to fulfill their needs. Again, this strategy will affect the individual animals, but also groups of animals. Think of the numbers of animals kept in the farming context, which are quite a lot. With these strategies, I come to the end of my presentation, where I relate again to One Health, One Welfare. And yes, the world is changing, but let's see the positive aspects. How fantastic it is that with our media, we can connect across the globe. And um, I hope we find each other maybe through associations as the International Society for Applied Ethology or UFO, and please feel free to reach out. I'm happy for feedback, and I hope to hear more about animal welfare research in Indonesia, and especially the developments on teaching and education in the veterinary curriculum in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Have a lovely conference and a good day. Thank you.